I made the worst possible decision ever today. I'm wearing a shirt that I know I'm gonna sweat in, but I thought based on its color, it wouldn't be that obvious, and it is. So I apologize ahead of time. It's the first hot day we've had, and I'm sweating big time. <laughs> Welcome to the channel, folks. My name's Shane. In today's video, we're checking out the Panasonic Lumix S5 Mark II full frame mirrorless camera. This is an absolute beast of a hybrid camera. The new image processor paired with the brand new 24 megapixel sensor allows us to record 10 bit internal up to 6K of resolution. This new sensor not only gives us 14 plus stops of dynamic range when shooting in vlog, but we also now get 779 phase detection points. We get a brand new autofocus system finally called Phase Hybrid and it works a treat. I'm gonna compare this up against my Sony in just a moment, and I think the results will shock you. The image stabilization system is now called Active IS, and it's a massive upgrade over the original S5, and I would argue it's almost, or if not as good, as the Panasonic GH6, which is a micro four thirds camera. While I am reviewing the Panasonic S5 Mark II today, Panasonic have also announced the S5 Mark II X, and we'll talk more about that in just a bit. I'm next going to cover all the video features for the S5 Mark II. This is a bit of a hybrid between the S1H and the S5, but also bringing new features to the table. When shooting in the MOV file format, the S5 Mark II is a 10-bit camera only. This is a combination of 10-bit 420 and 422, depending on the option you choose. The S5 Mark II goes all the way up to 10-bit 420 at 6K, and this is a full sensor readout. This is great if you want to do any type of cropping in post, if you need to cut a vertical video out, for example. For folks wondering if we get any 8-bit codecs, there's three under the MP4 menu. You can find them there, but all the cool stuff is under MOV. The S5 Mark II has an active cooling system, so there's some fan vents you can see on the top of the camera. This is a huge improvement over the original S5, which gave us 30 minute limits in those 10 bit modes. You could get around it by shooting 8 bit, but if you want to shoot 10 bit, this is the camera you can let run all day. Now, when it comes to the 5.9K and 6K modes, there is a 30 minute time limit on those, but once that times out, you can simply hit record again and you'll be in business. Thanks to the active cooling fan, I've had no problems with this overheating. Much like the S5 before it, we still get the full version of Vlog, which gives us access to that 14 plus stops of dynamic range. If you've never edited with Vlog before, it's super easy to color grade. Simply drop Panasonic's nicest LUT on there, make a few adjustments, and you're done. I really like editing with Vlog. I think the end result also looks really beautiful. The S5 Mark II now gives us a real-time LUT loader option, which allows you to bake in a LUT at the time of recording while filming in Vlog, getting the full dynamic range of the sensor. If you find yourself using the same LUT time and time again in post-production, you can now send it to the camera and bake that in in real time. This is great for fast turnaround projects. Additionally, if you don't want to shoot in Vlog, we still get all the great color profiles under the sun that Panasonic have given us for years. My favorite still, to this day, is the natural picture profile. The maximum frame rate the S5 Mark II can handle in the S and Q option is 180 frames per second. Now, the audio is removed and this is slowed down in camera. The sweet spot in my experience is 120 frames per second. This will be four times slower than if you're shooting at 30p or if you drop to 100 frames per second if you're in the PAL region, this will still be four times slower and the image quality looks awesome. We still get autofocus in that mode, although it is just contrast DFD, it works pretty well above 120 and you're back to manual focus and the quality of the image degrades. This is HD only. I would have loved to see this camera come out with 4K at 120 frames per second, but it's not there yet. Face hybrid autofocus works only to a maximum of 60 frames per second. And then from then on, it's contrast DFD. So if you want that, you can store a preset in the camera using 60 frames per second or lower. Much like the original S5, we can switch regions. So if you're in the PAL region, you travel to North America, you can switch it to NTSC without having to turn the camera on and off. I really like this feature. We also now get the addition of true 24 Hertz. So if you're a filmmaker, you'll get 24 frames per second on the nose. Under the recording quality options, we'll now see a new option on the S5 Mark II that we didn't see on the S5. And this is either 100 or 120 frames per second, depending on if you're in PAL or NTSC. This option retains the audio and you have the option to then slow it down in post to either 50%, or if you wanna slow it all the way down to one quarter, which is 25%, you have that flexibility. Or of course, you can just leave it in real time. Let's get stuck into the autofocus section of the video. Now this won't be as long as prior cameras because now, it just works, and I'm also gonna show you some practical examples up against the Sony a7S III. So on the back of the S5 Mark II, we get the same autofocus button. It's kind of next to the little lever. Push that button in, and it'll bring up the different modes. This is an example of wide area autofocus. You can see the yellow box around my face and the crosshair on my eye. This is much more reliable at a distance. It will then change to body tracking the further I move back. 
and this is the mode I've used in all of the autofocus samples you're about to see. Now this is also great if you're a product showcase kind of channel where you want to hold something up, it's going to go to the foreground and then back to me without any problems. You can see the box moving around quite a lot. This might be a little bit jarring if you haven't seen this before, but Panasonic have had this for a very long time and it just works. Now there's plenty of other modes. You can use one area mode, set up a box just in this area and do exactly the same thing. With human tracking on, it always prioritizes the face within an area that you choose. So just keep that in mind. Up next, I want to showcase just how great the autofocus is with the pre-existing lenses. So if you already own some S-series primes, there's no need to go buy anything else. These just work. The S5 Mark II pairs beautifully with the kit lens. So if you get the 20 to 60 millimeter F3.5 to 5.6, the autofocus performance is flawless. The same can be said for the 18mm f1.8 at 1.8. As you can see, the autofocus performance is beautiful. There's no DFD pulsing or jitters or any second guessing. It's the same story for the 24mm. I had no problems with autofocus with any of these lenses. The 35mm f1.8 at 1.8 performs beautifully and it's the same lens I'm using here in the studio. The 50mm is one of the least expensive S-series of primes in the range and it also gives you some of the best image quality. A lot of what you saw at the start of the video was filmed with the 50mm f1.8 at 1.8. Simply stunning and the autofocus performed beautifully. And over to the 85mm f1.8 at 1.8. If you want the background completely blurred out, this is the lens to buy and the autofocus has no problems keeping up. If the new Panasonic autofocus system hasn't surprised you enough already, I'm about to compare it up against the Sony A7S III. I'll be using 35 millimeter lenses on both. For the Sony, I'll be using this 35 millimeter, not the G Master, just this standard one, which is a great little lens. It's usually my primary studio shot here in the room. Both cameras are set to their wide autofocus area. I'll have eye tracking enabled on the Sony and human detection enabled on the Panasonic. The first test was just a basic walk test and they both perform beautifully. I would call this a tie. Running towards the camera, both pulled focus extremely fast. And again, there's no difference between the autofocus performance with the S5 Mark II and the Sony A7S III. Where I noticed the biggest difference with the Panasonic S5 Mark II's new face hybrid autofocus system is as I was walking in and out of frame, it found focus on the background faster and also transitioned quicker to the foreground, whereas the Sony kind of lagged a little bit behind, which was surprising. Just to let you know, I had the speed and responsiveness set to four. It was quite surprising to see just how much faster the Panasonic was at finding the background and also detecting me when I walked into frame. Now in a real world test, you might not be running across the frame in this type of scenario, but it was just to illustrate how fast the new autofocus system is on the S5 Mark II and I can still adjust the speed and sensitivity higher than what you just saw, as they're both set to plus one. There's two scenarios where the S5 Mark II outperformed the Sony. One was walking away from the camera. It not only tracked better than the Sony, but it found me a lot quicker. Now this might be handy if you're doing a lot of walk and talk stuff, for example, where you might be entering the frame at a distance. Secondly, the Panasonic also tracked me better if I was walking in and out of frame as fast as I could from side to side. This was quite a shock to see just how responsive the S5 Mark II's autofocus is in comparison to the Sony. I also wanted to see if I could trip up the autofocus system by being heavily backlit. So I went outside again at a particular time of the day where the sun was just blasting me from behind and it worked flawlessly. I didn't see it fail me once, which was really surprising. Being heavily backlit is by far the biggest Achilles heel of most autofocus systems. Straight out of the box, human tracking isn't enabled and this is how it performs. So I'll just show you a couple of quick autofocus tests right now. As you can see, it's extremely snappy and extremely reliable, but this mode won't work as well at a distance. While it's fine for a seated headshot like this, if I'm doing some of those run tests where the human tracking found me at a distance, it will lose me to the background. So turn human tracking on anytime you're actually in the shot, unless of course you're seated at a desk where you can just take this camera out of the box, hit record, and it'll work. 
Finally, well done Panasonic. <laughs> this awesome new autofocus system also translates over to the photography side of the camera. Whether I was shooting one photo at a time or using one of the burst rate modes, I was able to get an exceptional hit rate and I'll show you some examples on screen. While I'm clearly not a professional photographer, what I can tell you is the hit rate is exceptional and being used in the right scenario, this camera's autofocus will deliver the goods. So if you like to sit there and spray and pray like this and take a whole bunch of photos, they're gonna be in focus. Awesome. Let's talk about what's being changed over the original S5. So we now get a full size HDMI port. Finally, that was my biggest criticism of the S5 when I first got my hands on it, was that we got a micro HDMI. So no more of that. We get that full size HDMI plug. This is a huge upgrade. The second biggest update is that we now get active cooling and I've tested this up to 34 degrees Celsius and it never overheated once, so it works really well. If you take a look at the cameras from the front and back, they both look identical, but the S5 Mark II is slightly thicker, but it only comes in around 20 grams heavier. Another upgrade over the original S5 is that we now get a matching pair of UHS-2 SD card slots as opposed to the UHS-1 and UHS-2 that we found in the original. So if you want to get a sense of redundancy, you can record and shoot in all modes and back up on the fly to both cards. While the grip is essentially the same as the original S5, it does feel slightly chunkier because the body design is slightly thicker on the new camera. Overall though, it's a pleasant shooting experience. All the buttons and dials are in exactly the same position. So again, if you're coming from an original S5, you'll feel right at home. The fully articulating touchscreen on the S5 Mark II has one major advantage. It's at least twice as bright, perceivably, as the original S5. So shooting outdoors like this, it's so much easier to see. It was just something I was unaware of until I compared them directly here out in the park. Another one of the major upgrades is we finally get a resolution bump on the electronic viewfinder. We now get a 3.6 million dot count as opposed to the 2.26 million that we found on the original S5. The battery that we get is the BLK22. This is exactly the same as the one with the S5 or GH6. So if you have a couple of these laying around with the extra pins, they'll work in the S5 Mark II. Runtime on the camera is very solid. We get up to two hours and five minutes recording at 4K 24, 25 or 30 frames per second. If we're shooting at 4K 50 or 60p with that APS-C crop, we get one hour and 53 minutes. And this is obviously because there's more processing when it comes to 4K 50 or 60 frames per second. When I did these battery rundown tests, the camera did get warm, but never hot. The active cooling works beautifully. I could simply record until the battery died, put in another battery and record again up to its maximum limit. Additionally, the S5 Mark II now supports USB-C power delivery, which means you can charge the battery internally in the camera, which was something that the old S5 can do. But now with the S5 Mark II, you can turn it on and power it indefinitely while the camera is in use. On the back of the S5 Mark II, we have a Q button. This allows us to get quickly into all of our settings and adjust anything that we need to on the fly, whether that's the picture profile or if we wanna change exposure modes, hit the Q button and you'll be in business. Up next, I'm gonna show you the difference in the color science between the S5 Mark II and the S5 shooting in the natural picture profile. Both cameras are set identical. I'm using the same 50 millimeter primes on both. I'm using face detection autofocus, one's gonna perform far better than the other, right? So if you're wondering how that compares, it's not even close. But anyway, this is how it looks. Now, what I've noticed looking back at a lot of the footage with the S5 Mark II, it has a slightly more magenta look to the skin tone over that of the original S5, but you can correct this and change it in camera, push the hue a little bit more towards the green, and you're in business. So I usually tweak these settings in the color profiles to get the kind of look I'm going for. But this is how they compare, all settings being equal. The S5 Mark II has Panasonic's brand new in-body image stabilization system called Active IS. As you can see from this vlogging test using the 24 mm f1.8 prime, it handles my footsteps very well. There is a little bit of movement in the corners, but it's nowhere near as prominent as both the footsteps and the corner wobbles that you'd find on the original S5. Taking a look at the original S5, there's more impact shock when it comes to my walking, as well as more warpy stuff in the corners. Over to the GH6 with the 12 to 35 millimeter f2.8 lens. This should put into perspective just how smooth the S5 Mark II's active IS system is being that it's a full frame sensor. Over to the Sony, if I'm vlogging with this with active steady shot off, it's unusable. Turning active steady shot on on the Sony helps it to no end, although it does crop in a little bit as well, not giving you the true 24 millimeter field of view. 
When I first got my hands on the S5 Mark II, I did a follow shot comparison up against the Sony a7S III, and it absolutely wiped the floor for this particular shooting scenario with a 50 millimeter lens. I think it looks just as good as the GH6 in this particular situation, shooting with a 25 millimeter f1.7 on the GH6, but you can be the judge. IS boost mode is still supported, and this gives us better handheld stabilization to almost mimic that of a tripod. I usually map this feature to this button on the back here just by holding it down for a second. What this allows me to do is cycle between a follow shot with IS boost mode off and a stationary shot, giving me a tripod-like experience. It's one of the best things about Panasonic cameras, and there's no digital crops. On top of all of that, we still get e-stabilization, a mode I've never felt the need to use with the S5 Mark II. The benefit of the S5 Mark II is even though we get e-stabilization, which gives us a digital crop to get more stabilization, the results are fantastic without it. I actually think it looks better and you don't get any crops without e-stape on, so just leave it off. Another great feature on the S5 Mark II is the high resolution photo mode. If you plan on shooting landscapes, for example, you can get a 96 megapixel photo just by selecting that mode on the camera. High resolution mode takes a series of eight photos and compiles them in camera, quite fast as well, so there's no external software required to get a super high resolution photo. High resolution mode gives us two different options. Mode one allows you to capture an image of a static subject, and mode two works best if there's something moving in the frame like water. I tested this out extensively and the photos are super high resolution. I definitely encourage you to give this a shot if you get the S5 Mark II. There's only one thing to take note of. Unlike the GH6, which has a handheld high resolution mode, the S5 Mark II has to be on a tripod. The S5 Mark II takes the audio side to the next level when you compare it up against the original S5. It's still compatible, of course, with the original XLR adapter. I've had this since the days of the GH5 and it works beautifully on the S5 Mark II, and I've tested that extensively. The 3.5 millimeter audio input sounds great. You've been listening to it throughout the entirety of this video. We also get now two different gain structures. So standard mode is what you're listening to right now, but if I'm using a really hot shotgun microphone directly into that 3.5 millimeter audio input, we can drop it down to low to make sure that nothing clips internally within the camera. We also get a headphone output, which can be used not only to listen to your footage back after filming, but you can listen in real time if you're behind the camera filming someone else. The audio flexibility of the S5 Mark II now allows you to record 3.5 millimeter in, as well as that XLR adapter, giving you four channels of audio to work with. This might be great if you're doing an interview, but you also want to capture some ambient sounds with some shotgun microphones. Let's take a look at the low light performance in a real world scenario. So shooting on the pier, the ISO will go up to a maximum of 6400, where the image looks absolutely stunning. I also threw a couple of 100 frames per second clips in here as well, which does bump up the ISO, but overall, I still think it looks really nice. The S5 Mark II worked great up to 8000, and in a pinch, if you were getting desperate, you could crank it up to 12,800, but that would be the highest that I would go personally. I love how sharp the Panasonic is in a low lit situation and that phase hybrid autofocus works great. Just remember, if you are shooting in those higher frame rates above 60 frames per second, you're back to contrast DFD. So just keep that in mind. Earlier in the video, I mentioned that the S5 Mark II X is on the horizon and I'm gonna cover what makes it different to the S5 Mark II. So we get an all black design. This is a monochromatic design that is pretty visually striking. I actually really like it. Let us know what you think of that in the comments section. When it comes to video, the S5 Mark II X will give us the all intro and ProRes recording internal with the ability to output RAW over HDMI. So if shooting RAW is important to you, wait for the S5 Mark II X. The S5 Mark II X now gives us the ability to record out onto an SSD drive thanks to the USB-C output on the camera. This is very similar to what you might find on the GH6. If you plan on shooting in ProRes, SSD storage makes a whole lot more sense as it's far less expensive. The last big upgrade coming to the X is the fact that you'll have live streaming capability via ethernet or Wi-Fi. If you need all of those high-end capabilities, wait for the S5 Mark II X, but for everybody else, including myself, the S5 Mark II is an absolute powerhouse. All right, let's wrap this video up. I'm gonna talk about the pros and cons of the S5 Mark II full-frame mirrorless camera. By the way, if this video has been helpful, please leave a thumbs up, comment below, don't forget to subscribe and click the bell for all notifications. I'm going to be putting together a whole bunch of side videos with the S5 Mark II. All right, let's get into the cons list first. So no 4K at 120 frames per second. This is a bit of a bummer. I would have loved to have seen that on this camera, but it's not there yet. And sadly, there's no full frame 4K 50 or 60p option. I would have loved to have seen that as well, even with a time limit over unlimited recording with the crop sensor mode. Maybe they can bring that in 
in a future firmware upgrade. While it's not a deal breaker, it's a bit of a shame that the phase hybrid autofocus doesn't work up to 120 frames per second in HD. It would have completely changed this camera's usability for those faster frame rates. But the DFD actually works pretty good on the S5 and that's carried across to the S5 Mark II. The last small nitpick just comes down to the display information on the built-in screen. Now it works fine, but once you hook it up to an external monitor, you lose all of the information on the flippy screen. I love having them match. This is one thing that I loved about the GH5 and GH5S that didn't carry across to the GH6. So Panasonic, if you can, please bring that option back to see not only the information on an external monitor, but also on the flippy screen at the same time. Let's talk about the pros because they far outweigh the cons. I'm gonna start with the face hybrid autofocus. While there's a lot of modes and a lot to learn about a Panasonic camera, this is the first one you can take out of the box and the autofocus will just work. Turn on human tracking and you get some of the most reliable and snappy autofocus I've seen from any camera system that I've ever owned. If you've been waiting for the day for Panasonic to nail autofocus, the day is finally here. I love this autofocus system and I trust it. I don't have to keep looking at my reference screen to know that it's working. Shooting video with Vlog at 6K gave me some of the best results I've ever seen out of a mirrorless camera. It looks absolutely stunning. This full sensor readout not only allows you to crop in a 16 or 17 by nine aspect ratio, or many others, you can also crop a square or vertical video out and have more information above the traditional 16 by nine that you would find on a 4K timeline. So this is awesome, it really opens up a lot of possibilities for getting high quality social media content. The S5 Mark II's in-body image stabilization or active IS has been taken to the next level. So if you do a lot of handheld work, this would be my choice as the best full frame camera for run and gun filmmaking. Having active cooling inside this camera really put my mind at ease when shooting outside for extended periods of time on a really hot day or over the course of many days. So it survived that, I would have no problems recommending this when it comes to overheating or the lack thereof. We get all the same great filmmaker tools that we've come accustomed to with Panasonic cameras, including waveform, vector scopes, and framing markers. Framing markers make it really easy if you plan on cropping into a different aspect ratio in post. For those who like to manually focus, we get all the same great tools we saw in the original S5. That includes the linear focus option where we can determine how far we have to turn the focus ring to go from infinity to minimum. At the end of the day, the S5 Mark II is an absolute beast of a mirrorless camera. If you've been waiting for the day for Panasonic to finally get their act together, and put a phase hybrid autofocus system in, I don't think you'll be disappointed. Thanks for watching. See ya.